Good evening. My name is Dennis Fabizak. I'm the director of the East Hampton Library. I want to thank you all for attending the last of our Tom Toomey series 2018. Uh, it's been a really successful year. We've had higher attendance than the previous lectures, which is obvious. Um, and we're really thrilled that everybody's uh, realized that this is a, a worthwhile series and, and something that you must attend. Um, tonight is also our annual Tom Toomey local history lecture. We, we will continue to do that as the last lecture of the series each year. Um, and we've put together a wonderful program tonight. Uh, before we begin, we're, we want to thank LTV for filming again this year. All of the lectures will be aired on LTV for years to come. Uh, in that vein, we'd like to, you to silence your cell phones so we don't record them for prosperity. Uh, Tonight we have three incredible speakers speaking about the Gardner family legacy. First up will be Richard Barons, the former director, ex former executive director of the East Hampton Historical Society, uh, and now, as he likes to be called, the damn chief curator. Um, and he's going to show you some photos of Gardner's Island that I would assume nobody in this room has ever seen before, uh, which is going to be wonderful. Uh, following Richard, we're going to show a short clip from a, an interview and television program that Carl Grossman did in 1975. Uh, well, you'll, you'll see Gardner's Island. I, I would assume most of you haven't seen that as well. Uh, and it's a really amazing film. It's a little blurry, but the audio is, is great. And then Carl will give us a wonderful presentation about the island. And then at the end of the program will be Chip Ray. Uh, Chip has been the chair of the Tom Toomey series this year. Uh, he's done an amazing job, which you know shows by the fact that all of you are here and have attended all of our programs. And he's done a lot of research about the LVIS house <coughs> um, and some interesting stories behind it. And, and you're all going to learn a lot tonight, I'm sure. So without any ado... So the first thing is a warning. <clears throat> there is no relationship whatsoever between the illustrations that you'll see on the screen and what I'm talking about. <laughs> They're all pictures of our cat, so I hope you enjoy them. Um, what they are indeed is every once in a while a manila envelope comes to the office and we're never too worried. It's usually a photograph of, you know, a person on a beach or something like that. But this one was quite fat with no return address whatsoever um, and very garbled. It was very hard to read where it possibly could have been uh, stamped at. And <clears throat> I opened it up and there were 78 brown sepia tone photographs which were copies of original photographs taken on Gardner's Island in 1899 when the island was being used as it had been for, a, as it began to be used as a place for shooters who rented it. I have never seen these photographs before. I've tried to trace where they may have, might have come from. Um, that's been unsuccessful and completely impossible to trace who sent them to me. And you'll enjoy what the note said. If these are useful, enjoy them. If not, throw them away. So. <laughs> They're very gorgeous. But what, what my real job is tonight <clears throat> is to give you an overview of Gardner's Island and particularly of Lion Gardner. Gardner's Island lies visible as it seems to float at the horizon line just off Akabonic Harbor. In the early fall day, like a couple days ago when it wasn't pouring, its 3,700 acres resemble a sleeping giant blanketed in sort of a damp morning haze. It is a forbidden oasis surrounded by myth and misunderstanding. These fabrications have almost obliterated the historic facts that make the tale of New York State's first permanent English settler, Lion Gardner, fascinating. Do we look at the legend or do we examine the much more interesting material found in carefully preserved documents? So let's stay in the archive. 
It is within these primary sources that we start to construct the story of Gardner's Island, and in so doing, deconstruct the aristocratic trappings that have gilded the island's past since the late 19th century. It might help if we knew something about Lion Gardner's past. In, this extraordinary th in his extraordinary family Bible, which is safely preserved upstairs in the Long Island room, Gardner states that the, his, that the family tree starts with his marriage. He ignores his beginnings. There's no mention of his parents or place of birth. And only last year did we get a breakthrough. An English genealogy discovered a Lionel Gardner born in 1573 in Suffolk, who marries Elizabeth Woodhouse in 1593. They had a son named Lion, who was born outside of London in 1599 and died in East Hampton in 1663. Uh, when the genealogist did, did this, it was not a revelation. He had not known that for 200 and 300 years, we've had no idea whatsoever uh, the family, some said he was Scottish, some said he came from the Isle of Wight, etc. So, you know, uh, is this a revelation? Yes. The church records do survive. I mean, does it answer the question? We'll do a little more research. But this is now the third time that this has come up in the Gardner family genealogies from England. So I'm, I'm pretty pretty optimistic. We know that Lion Gardner was fighting in Holland on the side of the Dutch in an English army unit against the Spanish in the Eighty Years' War. He married Mary Durkant of Woerden, the daughter of an upper-class magistrate in southern Netherlands, in 1635. Gardner returned to England with his new wife that very same year, where he was classed as a sergeant and engineer specializing in fortifications. He was given an important commission as the commandant under Lord Say and Seal and Lord Brook to construct a fort in the New World at the mouth of the Connecticut River in a brand new settlement called Saybrook. The Gardners left England in July of 1635 and arrived in Boston at the end of November. They wintered in the city and arrived at Saybrook on April 1636. In August, their first child, David, was born. Gardner had been very much led astray. His contract with the two lords promised 300 workers and their families. When he arrived, there were a dozen. But he did get the fort built just in time for a series of attacks in 1637 that were part of the bloody Pequot Wars that had commenced the year before. Saybrook held fast against the angry Pequot nation this because the dates are so concise, I don't want to screw up and have you misled. And soon the British troops were reinforced by English-friendly natives, and most of the warring Pequots were destroyed. Many years later, in 1660, Gardner wrote an autobiographical narrative about the Pequot Wars, where he rec recounted his experiences with English rule, colonists, and native people. Gardner was unique for his period. He emphasized with the native population. He respected their valor and their civilization. He treated them as humans, not as his other military people did, as ungodly and unworthy. His fellow Englishmen dehumanized the native people. Gardner was also a leader of men who related to other successful leaders like the Montaukett Sachem Wyandanch. Wyandanch was sure that with the demise of the power-hungry Pequots, the Montaukett nation would never be the same. In a British-controlled new world, the Montaukets needed to form an alliance with the winners. Gardner and the British were hard-pressed to tell a friendly native from an unfriendly one. When Wyandanch approached Gardner about trading together, Gardner said that he would if the sachem could prove that he wasn't a Pequot. But as they became more familiar with one another, Wyandanch was clever and used property to confirm their relationship. The property was Manchunuk, an island 
if you translate, we're told that it means the island where many have died. Uh, he decided that he would sell the property to Gardner. It was a, probably an epidemic, by the way, that uh, killed all the inhabitants years before, but it was certainly, it was a no man's land, and if you were a smart realtor, you would know this was a wonderful thing to sell to someone English, something that no Indian would want to live at anyway, so why not, right? But it wasn't a gift, it was a sale. In 1639, when his term at Saybrook was over, the gardeners moved to a place the English map makers called the Isle of Wight. That is now Gardner's Island. The island belonged to the Montaukets, but it also belonged to someone else. It belonged to William Alexander, Earl of Stirling, a Scot, poet, and secretary to King James I. In 1635, Stirling had received all of Long Island, Cape Cod, Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and about 65 smaller islands in a royal grant. He had originally received an earlier royal grant, uh, which gave him an area in Canada, which, of course, the French thought they owned. Um, and being a proper Scot, he named it Nova Scotia, New Scotland. Um, but he had an enormous amount of trouble uh, with settling it. I think two or three times everyone froze to death. So he traded it in, so to speak, and got Long Island and all this other stuff. So sort of an amazing story, to say the least. In 1635, Sterling had received all of these wonderful places. And it is probably the royal grant that many generations of gardeners have assumed was a royal grant to Gardner. Mm, not really. It was really, it was really to Lord Sterling. So anyway, um, Lord Sterling's Boston agent, a man called Ferret, found out that this, about the sale, but this was not a major problem because a, a unique situation was placed between the buyer and the seller of the land that Sterling was trying to get rid of. He was about to go bankrupt because of all the money he'd spent on other problems, so he was quite anxious to sell things. And that was that the purchaser had to negotiate with the native people and work with them first, and if that was successful, then he would be willing to sell the land. So in this instance, it just happened sort of the other way around, and a satisfactory payment was arranged. Uh, the deed required in quotes, Lion Gardner and his successors shall pay to the said Earl a yearly acknowledgement being the sum of five pounds lawful money of England. The Gardner Plantation became the first permanent English settlement in what is now New York State. A year later, Southampton and Southhold were founded in 1640. Uh, when the gardener's third child, Elizabeth, was born in 1641, she was believed to be the first English birth in New York. East Hampton was formed in 1648, of course. Lion Gardner decided to leave the island and the farmhouse and he chose to purchase a lot in 1653 in East Hampton Town. Gardner died in 1663. His will left his whole estate, in quotes, both the island and all that I have in East Hampton to my wife, end of quotes. Mary Gardner died in 1665, and she bequeathed, in quote, my island, called the Isle of Wight, to my son David. And this was not something that Lion Gardner really wanted, his son had racked up enormous amount of debts, you know, while he was, uh, while Lion Gardner was paying the money. So it really wasn't what was wanted, but it's what happened. And David Gardner ended up playing an extremely important role in the island's history. And that was, it was because of David that the property became a manor. In 1665, Richard Nichols, New York's deputy governor, established a private governmental compounds, and he called them either governorships, independent patents, or manors, to satisfy his wealthy supporters and patrons. The manor owner was the legal governor of his property. He could create laws, he could ignore the politics, or even the taxes from the mainland. In 1683, the town of East Hampton, with the help of the New York uh, General Assembly, 
annexed David Gardner's manor and removed the privileged status that he had enjoyed on the island. He was not impressed. East Hampton had circumvented his power. Gardner shot back at the uppity town and petitioned Governor Dongan to regain his control. And on September 11th, 1686, he was vindicated and was granted lordship and manor of Gardner's Island, in quotes. And that's probably the first time that we historians have found Gardner's Island used instead of the Isle of Wight. Very few of the owners of New York 17th century manors called themselves lord. The powerful Jeremiah Van Rensselaer, holder of one of the largest manors in the colonies in Upper Hudson, was asked what he felt about the title lord. And he said, and I quote, hmm, it does not amount to much as you know, end of quote. Proprietor was the term that was used on the island until uh, the romantic end of the 19th century. In 1699, Captain William King, Kidd, anchored off Gardner's Island as he tried to come to terms with the predicament that he had found himself in. Kidd said he was a privateer. England wanted to hang him as a pirate. He needed provisions, and he also needed to offload some treasure that he hoped to use to bargain a reprieve with Boston's Lord Bellamont. After a few businesses, business visits, um, a couple suppers, trading some items, including the cloth of gold, of which was, there's a sample in the Long Island room here, uh, with Gardner and his family, Kidd requested that Gardner store several bags and boxes for him in a locked room until he returned. After Kidd's arrest, because he made the mistake of going to Boston and thinking that they would negotiate with him, uh, he was able to retrieve, the governor retrieve the information as to where the treasure was. So Gardner brought it to Boston, got a receipt, listing, listing every single item, including counts of diamonds. Um, and that receipt has survived. So anyone who thinks that there's still a treasure there, I mean, there may be, but Gardner didn't bury it. He mentions that he put it in a locked closet and certainly, um, who, most people have no idea in reality that it was all returned. And it's a, you can find that on several websites. If you go to Gardner's Treasure, you'll get a copy of all that amazing stuff. And it was amazing, and there was a lot of it. And there were several things that are listed on the inventory, and this is pretty classic out here. Several things that were listed on the inventory that Gardner got from the governor that did not appear when the treasure went to London for the Royal Treasury. Huh. I have no idea how that could possibly have even happened. By 1788, the gardeners were no longer able to keep their island's powers that had come with their mannership. The New York State Legislature annexed the island to East Hampton Town as it has been ever since. Thank God for their taxes. There are many fascinating stories that have come to light in the last few years that paint a very interesting picture of the island and its inhabitants, such as the raid on the island by the British troops, what was taken, what was bothered, the sorry state that the island was after the, the Revolutionary War, the cash crops that were so important to the wealth of the island, which we all know included mostly what we think, cattle and, and sheep, but by the early 19th century, Gardner's Island was one of the largest nurseries on the East Coast. The list of fruit trees, plant stock, mostly coming from abroad, is extremely impressive. Hundreds and hundreds of apple trees of different varieties that they had that they then sold to New York and Boston. So it, it, was, it was not a hobby. It was a, a big business. A constant island that appears in island ledgers is hard cider. Kid got bought two uh, kegs of hard cider to take to his men on, on board his ship. So it's, it's, it was something that they were specializing in. There must have been many, many apple trees. And it's also interesting to see uh, how many local well-to-do people from East Hampton appear in the ledgers under debt owed for hard cider.
There were ups and downs in the island's prosperity. Poor management was often countered by arranged marriages. After John Lyon Gardner, he was the seventh proprietor, appointed at the age of four, uh, died in 1816, his young wife Sarah helped boost the island's economy by investing in land development. She speculated in huge acreages in Constableville, Boonville, Gloversville, up on the tip of the Adirondacks in northern New York. And recently, several years of correspondence have come to light that document the history of Sarah Gardner's creation and subsequent settlement of the village of Windsor in New York's southern tier. The papers are so meticulous as to arranging for this village that it even includes a drawing of what the church will look like because they think that building a church is a good thing because you might get Christian people to come to your village. Sarah died in 1863, having successfully increased the net worth of the family almost twofold. Now, that's a doctoral thesis for women's studies, to say the least. By 1891, the island was no longer an income-producing business. So the 12th proprietor, John Lyon Gardner, leased the shooting rights to a group of sportsmen. Money for the island's upkeep and taxes were running low, while the cost of Gardner family's lifestyle continued to excel. In 1937, with the bank about to foreclose on a mortgage, Sarah Diodati Gardner bought the land just before it was to go to auction for $400,000. She became the island's 16th proprietor, which somehow Robert David Lyon Gardner never spoke about. Uh, Sarah had, had grown up summering in the manor house while her mother was busy reviving the legacy of Lyon Gardner by commissioning monuments to commemorate her family's heritage such as the James Remwick designed tomb in Old South Burying Grounds, covered by a Gothic-inspired canopy. Lion Gardner looks like a knight from King Arthur's court. Lion Gardner was one of the handful of important colonial men who shaped much more than East Hampton settlement. Adventurous, entrepreneurial, charismatic, diplomatic, visionary, and always a leader and friend. He may be one of the most ignored major figures in American history. Somehow, we can do something about that, can't we? Thank you. Robert David Lyon Gardner, the 14th Lord of the Manor of Gardner's Island. The, the original Gardner, when did he come here and why did he come here? Uh, he came to uh, America in 1635 to build fort in New England against the Dutch, who were then in New Amsterdam. And he was the first military engineer to be sent by the war office for that purpose, to defend the British Empire, such as it was named in Massachusetts Bay Colony. How come this island? Why did they go to this island? He was on a four-year contract. He didn't come here to emigrate like most people. And his letter is still extant to the war office. He said, me lords, I would fain brave all the savages of the new world than go back across that dreadful Atlantic. So I bought an island of mine own from the Indian, Chief Wyandanch, and I should humbly petition His Majesty to grant it to me. So it was made the first lordship and manor in America. The Gardner family, for, for, for many years, ran this place as sort of a self-contained... Uh... Uh, plantation. We had our own blacksmith shop. We made our own ironware, locks, hammers, hinges, uh, burly blacksmiths. Uh, man the forge you can see the forge there today and the anvil uh, the windmills ground the grain there were five windmills on the island in its heyday there was one that was built only to last 200 uh, two years which was to saw the mahogany we brought from the honduras across the caribbean and up the coast of florida up to montauk point and around here and i have beautiful dining room tables that were made from that mahogany and we had sawmills that were powered by the windmill which was strapped by the cowhide straps and with reduction gears operated the sawmills with the wind power. It was also looms. We, the, the, the tens of thousands of sheep on the island, the women would card the, the wool of the sheep into uh, thread on spinning wheels. And then it was spun. Then the windmills operated looms and the shuttles went back and forth 
and actually wove homespun coats for our servants to have wool coats in the winter. And they were made here on the island. I even have blankets that were made. Gardner's Island wool made into blankets. It was a self-sufficient place then. You, you... Well, yes, we had orchards down this hill. There were pear orchards and apple orchards. Unfortunately, the fruit trees do not last long. But uh, in East Hampton, they still have Gardner's Island peach trees, descended from the peaches here. This island represents America before Columbus discovered it. It's had the least use by man. It was the most destructive creature on this planet. For hundreds of years, we have used this as a private estate. Luckily, we've had no fire in the Virgin Oak Forest, which is the largest one left on the Atlantic seaboard. We have approximately a thousand deer, which we have to shoot to reduce the herd to three, 700. We have to shoot 300 every year. Unfortunately, the does know nothing about the pill. And the result is, the herd increases. There are no wolves as there used to be here. I couldn't get Mrs. Mackey to stay in the house if there were wolves around here. And I don't mean the other kind. I mean the wolves that howl. This is a very bountiful place. It's a yeah. place of milk and honey. Uh... There were five freshwater streams. That's why my ancestor got it. The only island that had freshwater streams. We didn't even need a pump to pump the water up. The water, freshwater flowed on the surface of the ground. It was a paradise for his family. The animals could drink that water. Uh, we had it today for lunch. There's no chlorine in it. It's crystal clear. You can drink out of the stream. There are sponges in the ponds that don't exist on the mainland anymore because of pollutants, detergents. Here, it is just as clean as it was 300 years ago. And because there are few people that live here, only three families all year round. It's sort of like a time capsule then as to what Long Island was before. A complete time capsule. You've got some oaks that have been growing since before Columbus discovered America. They're still growing. They're second only to the redwoods in California. We have quail, we have wild turkey, and they're so much better eating than the barnyard turkey that you get in the supermarket. These have never eaten corn. They've only eaten acorns and berries. The meat is tender. It's not coarse. And the birds are much smaller, of course. They fly like pheasants. They're a this, tough shot to shoot. There's strawberry and there's apples. Strawberries. Uh, they, they, there are wild blackberries here, of course, that wild turkey love to eat. Wine berries. Grapes, lots of wild grapes. We make jelly, eat with the venison when we eat the venison steaks and the chops. And once I ran out of eggs here, and I had four ambassadors in the house, and I had a few eggs, and the rest was deer's brains, and they looked sure as could be like scrambled eggs. So I managed to have enough eggs for breakfast. Nobody knew it until afterwards, and then I told them they were eating deer's brains. When you, when you think of, of this island, it's an unspoiled paradise, as you say, and you look at the rest of Long Island right out there and what's happened to it in the last couple of hundred years, what do you think about it? Well, I think it's tragic. We seem to be engulfed in a debris of plastic, which never breaks down. And there are Coke containers and uh, uh, plastic bottles of uh, Clorox and detergents. And it's tragic. Even on the beach here, you get all these plastic containers washed up by the sea, and they just don't disintegrate. That was me with long hair many years ago. Uh, I've been to many beautiful islands, Bora Bora, Paros, Mykonos, Nantucket, Hattiehunk, Tahiti, Orea, Santorini, Virgin Gorda, Tobago, but just off Long Island shores is a, a gem, splendorous, an exquisite island that excels any. It's been, well, you just heard Mr. Gardner call it a paradise. And and indeed a time capsule of what the, the best of Long Island once was. Gardner's Island, an ecological and historical jewel. According to the East Hampton Town's 1984 comprehensive plan, Gardner Island's, Gardner's Island stands as a unique expression 
of unspoiled terrain and at a time when few such areas exist. The 3,000 plus acre island is home to hundreds of bird species, freshwater ponds, that 1,000 acre white oak forest, Bostwick Woods, is the oldest English settlement in New York. I first went to Gardner's Island, well now nearly 50 years ago. Uh, Robert David Lyon Gardner, who always described himself as the 16th Lord of the Manor of the island, which for nearly 4,400 years has been privately held by one family, welcomed a large campout of Boy Scouts on it in 1971. I was a, a big Boy Scout, indeed I was an Eagle Scout, and I had seen the island from afar and I thought this would be a great event and I covered the campout for the daily Long Island Press and I interviewed Mr. Gardner for the first time on the island. The next year, 1972, I got to know Gardner pretty well when he ran for Congress in the first congressional district on the conservative party ticket against incumbent Otis Pike uh, in protest to Pike's effort for federal acquisition of the island. Gardner was no conservative. Indeed, he ran for state senate in 1960 as a Democrat. It was quite a scene when he ran for Congress, this kind of an American aristocrat with his near British manner of speech and sporting a blue blazer with a breast pocket medallion mixing with conservative party members in Ronkonkoma and Babylon and so forth, some of them Trumpsters of the time. Mr. Gardner told American Heritage magazine in 1975 the DuPonts, the Rockefellers, the Fords, they had no riche. The DuPonts came in 1800. They're not even a colonial family. Gardner lost the, the race, of course, but there was also a letter writing campaign. 80,000 letters opposing Pike's bill was sent to the House Committee on the Interior and, and Otis withdrew his bill. Gardner was subsequently a guest of, on my weekly TV show, Long Island World and WLIW, that's Channel 21, the Long Island PBS station, and I did more interviews with him for print. Meanwhile, in 1974, my family had been living in Sayville for a decade, and I saw parts of that very pleasant hamlet being hit by development sprawl, the sprawl that had enveloped so much of western Long Island. Although raised in the city, I always loved the country. My wife, Janet, sitting there, who grew up in what was then country like Huntington Beach, and our two boys moved in 1974, to Sag Harbor, where in fact I had roots. My paternal grandfather, an engraver, came to Sag Harbor more than a century ago from Hungary and worked at Fahey's watch case factory. Engraving was a, a, an art among Hungarian Jews. And Joseph Fahey recruited Hungarian and Italian engravers, transporting them from Ellis Island to Sag Harbor. Uh, this is where my grandfather met my grandmother, who had been staying with her sister, who had married into the Spitz family, many of its members, watch case factory workers. Thinking about development in Suffolk as we moved east, I got the idea of making a TV documentary, Can Suffolk Be Saved? And others were thinking the same after Suffolk County Executive John V. N. Klein, raised in what was then a country like Smithtown, took a trip on a helicopter and looking down saw the sprawl blanking so much of western Suffolk and then the green expanses of the East End, his innovative Suffolk County Farmland Preservation Program got started same year, 1974. I envisioned 10 half-hour TV programs and of starting the series on Gardner's Island as a sort of baseline. Gardner graciously gave me permission. I describe it as a time capsule and uh, in what's called a stand-up in TV on the island, I asked whether, the, whether Suffolk can be exempt from that 100-mile swath of sprawl from Boston running through New York down to Washington. Gardner's Island, its nature, Bostwick Woods, its fields and meadows, its birds and other animal life, its creeks, 
lagoon, his historic buildings, breathtaking. Lion Gardner, as you heard, brought it from the Montauk Indians in 1639. Has, has been reported for a large dog, one gun, some powder and shots, some rum, and several blankets. I, I wonder whether the Montaukets and their chief Wyandans really knew what was happening, as Native Americans never considered land something that can be bought and sold. Another factor here, as was mentioned, the Pequots of Connecticut and their war with the Montaukets and English settlers. There was an alliance between the settlers and the Montaukets to counter the Pequots. Among the structures on Gardner's Island, that windmill, brilliant, white, built in 1795 by Nathaniel Dominey of East Hampton. It's now on the National Historic Register. There's a carpenter's shed built in 1639, the oldest surviving wood frame structure in New York State. There's the Manor House, originally built in 1774. It burned down in 1947. Its replacement, built in that year, is splendid. To witness the shoot, Mr. Gardner invited actress Gloria Swanson, star of the film Sunset Boulevard, and her husband, William Dufty, author of Sugar Blues. We all met at the Gardner Mansion in East Hampton, just down the street, where Mr. Gardner proudly showed the portrait by Salvatore Dali, he emphasized, of the stunning red-haired former British model Eunice Bailey Oaks, whom he wed in 1961. Then we took off from Three Mile Harbor on Mr. Gardner's boat. He at the wheel, talking as he drove. On the island, I, I introduced, and, and you can actually see the whole Can Suffolk Be Saved, which was aired on both WLIW and WPIX-TV in New York. It's interesting, the people from the city when they saw it on 21, were interested, and they had the whole five hours. And then we go on the beds of two trucks on a tour of the island, which Mr. Gardner narrated. Uh, he told us uh, the Captain Kidd story, and how Captain Kidd, well, he claimed that Captain Kidd buried treasure in a ravine in 1699, uh, and he took us to this ravine. It's marked. Uh, he told us that... Uh, Captain Kidd warned John Winthrop Gardner that if the treasure wasn't there, when he returned, he killed the entire Gardner family. Captain Kidd then had headed off to Boston, where he was captured, put on trial for piracy, executed. The Gardners were ordered to return the treasure of gold dust, silver bars, gold, Spanish coins, rubies, and diamonds. One diamond wasn't immediately found and was later given to uh, her daughter Elizabeth Gardner, also a piece of cloth embroidered with gold, had been given by Captain Kidd to her mother and is now part of the Long Island collection right here. Uh, Gardner spoke about uh, Julia Gardner, born on the island, who became President John Tyler's second wife, the first lady. We had run out of time, and, and uh, run, run, out, run out of film. We would shut this in film. This is the 70s. And what should we do? Uh, Bob and I felt that Mr. Garden was having such a fine time, especially directing uh, his words at uh, Miss Swanson, uh, who he seemed to be awestruck by, that the camera person should just uh, keep rolling. Uh, <laughs> then we had a gala lunch at the manor house. Uh, at a centerpiece table was Mr. Gardner, and he positioned on one side of him Miss Swanson, and the other side, uh, the other woman in our group, uh, environmentalist Lorna Salzman. I kind of got the feeling of being at a ceremonial meal of an English royal centuries ago. Thereafter, a feud developed between Gardner and his niece, Alexandra Creel Goglet, who stood to inherit the half share of the island held by Gardner's sister, Alexandra Gardner Creel. Their battle continued for years. Gardner accused his niece and her husband of planning to sell the island for development. He refused to pay his share of the $2 million a year in upkeep and taxes. At one point, Gardner accused Mr. Golette of trying to run him over with a truck 
on the island. Uh, he repeated that many times. That was a big charge. Uh, and Gardner switched in terms of his position on the island, saying he wasn't opposed anymore to ownership of the island by the government or a private conservation group. Uh, in starting in 1980, Gardner was barred by the surrogate's court from visiting the island because he wasn't paying his share. Uh, and only in 1992 was that uh, decision, that ruling, overturned. Also, because Gardner had no hairs, he sought unsuccessfully in 1989 to smite Miss Golett to, and adopt a son, a Mississippi businessman, George Gardner Green, Jr., a distant descendant of Lion Gardner. Uh, Mrs. Creel's ownership went to her daughter when she died in 1990. Mr. Gardner died in 2004 at 93 at his mansion here in East Hampton. Eunice subsequently died, and total ownership passed to Mrs. Golette. What will be the future of Gardner's Island? A few months after Mr. Gardner's death, a 20-year conservation easement covering more than 90% of the island was arranged with the town of East Hampton. Said my old and very missed friend, Tom Toomey, attorney for the Golettes, this is a way for the family to keep their long-standing pledge not to develop the land for the foreseeable future. The easement arrangement was contingent on a promise from the town that it wouldn't further upzone the island, change its assessment, or attempt to acquire it by condemnation. Tom stressed the Golet family believes that maintaining the island's existing yield in terms of housing increases the island's value and discourages the government from attempting to buy it without compensation. Miss Golette opposed a 1993 upzoning of the island from one to five acres, but that happened anyway. In 2001, there was a move by the town for more restrictive zoning to 25 houses per acre. I'm sorry, 25 acres per house, the other way around. Uh, this is in New York City. Lee Koppelman, executive director of the Long Island Regional Planning Board and a longtime Suffolk planner, recommended then that the development rights for the island be purchased by the government. Uh, this is the basis, incidentally, of the Farmland Preservation Program. Or, said Lee, the island could become a limited access national park or a national wildlife refuge. Uh, he laid this out in an interview in the New York Times with my old reporter friend, John Rather. Uh, headline of that story was, Gardner's Island, the War of Wills. Mr. Koppelman comments in the piece that the island's uniqueness and historical and environmental importance would make federal commitment not unlikely. He described Gardner's Island as perhaps the most important offshore island in the entire Atlantic seashore from Maine to Florida. John Rather quoted Koppelman as further saying that the Golettes had done a magnificent job in properly protecting and maintaining the island. Lee, incidentally, knew Gardner. He had served on the Suffolk County Planning Board after Lee first became Suffolk Planning Director. Koppelman emphasized the overriding concern is for the long-term future. Still, Ms. Golette in the article stressed that the Golettes had willingly and by ourselves supported the island for more than 20 years. My children intend to carry on the tradition. Koppelman said that more strict of 25-acre zoning was not a solution. Uh, Five-acre zoning would allow for 650 homes. Under 25-acre zoning, 130 homes. And said Lee, even 130 homes would irretrievably change the unique character and environment of the island. Mr. Gardner's attorney, Joseph Antonito, said that Gardner would welcome a government role in the island's future. He was quoted as saying, this is the lawyer, Mr. Gardner has consistently said, almost like a mantra, that the island has to be preserved as it is today. He would be supportive of Lee Koppelman's proposals and even of a national park, provided that he would, it would, not, he would not want a Jones Beach because the ecology of the island is way too fragile. The lawyer went on, the island is an extremely expensive place to run as a private second home. He said Mr. Gardner was convinced that the Golettes would develop the island because they would be unable 
or unwilling to pay maintenance costs. But Mrs. Golette was quoted in the same article as saying she didn't foresee needing government help. She said, I respect the concern of those who live in East Hampton for the long-term continuation of the current use of Gardner's Island. Nevertheless, the island is my home. Proposal for changes in ownership of it through governmental action, however well-intentioned and however limited, are very troubling to me and my family. Ms. Golette is an environmentalist. She has a master's degree from Yale, the Yale School of Forestry. Uh, Mr. Golette is a former chairman of the American Museum of Natural History. The Golette family has enormous wealth based in New York City real estate. The Golettes have been, and, and Mr. Gardner too, of course, excellent stewards of Gardner's Island. But for me, I worry, will wonderful Gardner's Island in future years, in another 400 years, be saved? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm Chip Ray. I'm going to try and wrap this up, and I'm going to look at the um, LVIS property, 95 Main Street. Um, as we've talked of in the last two speakers, this was the manor house that was built in 1947 after the wooden one burned in a spectacular fire. The insurance company would not insure a wooden house on that island any longer. So Sarah Diodati Gardner, the woman who saved the island in the 30s, uh, built this house. It's a copy of a Virginia plantation, and that is the house that is on the island now. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you tonight about my topic. I've had a lot of help from many people in doing this. I wanted to thank Andrea Meyer, the archivist in the Long Island Collection of the East Hampton Library, who's worked with me almost daily for the last four weeks. I wanted to thank Ann Roberts, who chairs the archive committee at the LVIS, for opening up all their files. And as you can imagine, the LVIS has the most meticulous files on their property that you've ever seen. Ann Thomas, the president of the LVIS, greased all the wheels to make all this happen. And also I want to thank Bob Hefner, the Director of Historic Services for the Village of East Hampton, who can talk about the gardeners while we sat over a cup of coffee as if he was talking about his own house. So off we go. This is the LVIS today, an imposing house. Uh, many people said, oh, Chip, you're, what are you talking about? You're talking about the Gardner Mansion. Well, it's had many, many names over its history. Uh, in the last 250 years, it's been called the 95 Main Street, which is a more modern term by its address. It's been called the LVIS headquarters. It's been called the Gardner Brown House. Today, it actually is brown because the shingles are brown. Uh, 150 years ago, it was actually painted brown. And it was called the Gardner Brown House because, as you've heard, the Gardners owned many houses on Main Street. And a house down the street, they had painted white. So when you wanted to go to one of the Gardner's house, you had to ask where you're going to the Gardner Brown House or the Gardner White House. Um, Winthrop Gardner, who I'm going to talk about at length, um, was the real person who created this estate. And he only lived in this house for about 25 years. Uh, they sold it in 1950 to the Baker family. And the Baker family lived there from 1950 until 1980. So even though we think of it as Winthrop Gardner's house, um, he didn't live there the longest. The people he sold it to lived there a little longer than he did. Uh, in Gardner's time, he also called this house Durkent House. And as we've heard, Durkent was an old family Gardner name. And he and his wife revived that name. And when they lived here, you would get an invitation to join them at a musical uh, uh, celebration or a party at Durkent House. So we're looking down Main Street, towards, uh, headed towards Bridgehampton, and there on the right is the house. This is about 1915. It's a postcard. Uh, you see the gate, uh, the opening by the front door. That's essentially the same opening that's in that fence today. So if you stand there huddled waiting for a jitney, that gate is right behind you. And you see exactly how close this house was to the street. Uh, it was built in 1747 for David Gardner, the fourth proprietor of the island. Uh, upon its completion, it was the largest and most sophisticated house in East Hampton, and Bob Hefner thinks it was the first Georgian house in East Hampton. We know East Hampton because it had many salt box houses, and they all sort of faced towards the ocean. This house took architecture in East Hampton to an entirely different level. It was much fancier. It was based on English plate books, and it sort of set the stage for the next wave of architecture that engulfed the village. 
Over the next 200 years, this house was the East Hampton headquarters for the people that controlled Gardner's Island. Uh, they, at different times, they lived on the island. At different times, it was rented. But this was the house where usually the proprietor of the island lived. So it was a very famous house. It was sort of their in-town headquarters. Uh, the island was sort of the, the outskirts where they went for other events. It's often said that within the four walls of this house, there is more history of East Hampton than any other building in the village. The house is well known because it had these steps that cascaded onto the sidewalk. And uh, you can see them here. The steps were given, permission to build these steps were given to the gardeners by the town fathers in the 1820s. No other house on the street was given this permission. And you can see that it gives a nice gentle rise up to the front door. As you can see, the front door stood directly behind that fence. Uh, many people tripped over these steps as they walked on the sidewalk. Um, children played on these steps. The steps were generally a nuisance to the people in East Hampton Village, and the town fathers in the 19th century and the 20th century asked the gardeners to take these steps away, and they said, no, by town decree, we were given permission to have our steps. They're not going anywhere. If you've been to the 1770 house, which is a later house and a somewhat similar house, and you walk up those steps, you know how abrupt they are. They're steep, and you're, you go right up to the door. Well, the gardeners would have none of that, so they had their own steps cascading onto the sidewalk. This is the back of the house. Uh, uh, in the, around 1900, I think this is David Gardner. Uh, I'm going to talk about him for a second. But we're in the back of the house at the kitchen wing, and this is the, uh, the well. I think that well is still there. It's the round, circular stone thing that's just off the fence. Uh, but you can see that the house was shingled, and it was very brown. David Gardner is an amazing person, and in the modern history of the house, I'm going to talk about him the most. Uh, he was born in the house in 1840. He died in the house in 1924. Uh, he refused to modernize it. And so as East Hampton developed into a summer colony with all sorts of money and all sorts of fancy houses, he lived here in 1924 with no electricity, one spigot of water, uh, no bathrooms. Uh, the house was heated mostly by fireplaces and stoves. And only in his very late years did he agree to put in a very small furnace and four radiators. This is an extraordinary property. And this was the size of David Gardner's house. This is Main Street. The house stood here. This is all the way back to where the chicken coop or the Hampton Markets is on Race Lane. He owned over to the corner of Newtown Lane. And he, this is an amazing piece of property. Look at this property. Look at this property. Look at these properties. These were home lots that were granted. Uh, but th the gardeners owned an enormous amount of land. It said that David Gardner owned thousands of acres in the Northwest Woods. And he owned hundreds of acres in East Hampton. He bought and sold land all the time. And, uh, in this land, the yellow, he actually ran a farm. So in the middle of a growing East Hampton village, we have a guy who's looking backward, not forward, running a first-class farm. The farm was immense. It included hay barns, housing for farmhands, mule barns, cattle barns, horse barns, a dairy, a duck pond, and a geese pond occupied where the sunken garden is. Peacocks and white cats roamed the property freely. David's passion was trotting horses. He both raised them on this property and he raced them. Uh, in 1893, he took a trip to the west. And when he was out there, he saw buffalo for the first time. And he decided to bring four buffalo back to East Hampton on the train with him. And the train, <laughs> the train pulls into East Hampton. And this is all farmland and pasture back here then. And he decides he's going to breed his four buffalo with his cattle. It was a disaster. The cattle had no interest in the buffalo, and the buffalo had no interest in the cattle. Uh, the, the buffalo broke through all his fences. They were found running around the village. For a while, he sequestered them up in the northwest woods to some of the land he had up there, and he became incredibly frustrated. In 1904, the buffalo that were left were donated to the Bronx Zoo. Um, <laughs> David was an amazing businessman. You heard earlier about how uh, Sarah Diodati Gardner was an amazing businesswoman. David was an amazing businessman. He, uh, by his land ownings, buying and selling real estate, um, he really sort of stood out. And I want you to see that this piece of property went here, and it went here, and it went here. And when the railroad was shoved into East Hampton in 1894, for many years it had stopped in Bridgehampton, David insisted on donating the land from the corner of his property 
So the village and the train, the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Long Island Railroad, could build this train station. And people said, oh, David, that's a wonderful gesture you're doing. Uh, it's so nice of you to donate this land. People can take the train out from the city. They can come right to East Hampton, and they will get off in this bucolic town, sort of at the far end of town, which was mostly fields. David was no fool. He immediately founded the East Hampton Lumber Company and built giant buildings here, uh, which is now where the Riverhead Lumber Company is. Um, and much to the horror of the town fathers and the LVIS, all of a sudden you got off a train and you were looking at warehouses full of lumber. The LVIS reacted by insisting on planting vines on these buildings, and for many years they tried to cover them up with vines. It didn't work. <laughs> David also uh, founded the local water company, and he helped found the local electric company. So an amazingly, uh, an amazing businessman with a real sense of the future that we certainly lived in the past. So this was his house about 1900, with the steps cascading onto Main Street, uh, a white house at this point, even though we call it the Gardner Brown House. At different points, it's been colored white. And this is what it looked like. David dies in 1924 and is buried on Gardner's Island. The house is considered ancient. It's an anachronism. Uh, the village had moved up towards Newtown Lane at that point. There was lots of businesses, lots of cars, lots of wealthy summer people. And here, smack in the middle of the village, was this ancient, ancient house. This sets the stage for the next owner of the house. David left his house, and he left many, many thousands of acres to Winthrop Gardner Sr. And Winthrop Gardner Sr., when he inherited all this, lived down the street in a house called the Mill House. This is on the corner of James Lane and the Maidstone Lane. Uh, it's actually looking exactly like this now because the village has undertaken a restoration of it, and that was the Gardner windmill there. But this is where uh, Winthrop Gardner Sr. lived when David left him the house. And he came into so much money, he decided, I'm not going to live in this little house anymore. Even though in his time, he had added on to it. And you can see that he had grand ideas about a porch with nice arcades, a circular driveway. But this was a simple house. He decided to move up the street. And uh, over uh, the next 10 years, built himself a first-class mansion. By way of background, Winthrop Gardner Sr. was uh, born on Gardner's Island in 1887. He was educated at St. Paul's Prep School in New Hampshire, uh, attended Cambridge University in the UK. Uh, he was a real estate agent, um, even though he was sort of a country squire at the same time. Winthrop Gardner Sr., and this is the land that he inherited from David, also owned astonishing land in East Hampton. The Maidstone Golf Club, when it moved to the ocean, didn't own most of the land the golf course was on. It rented it from Winthrop Gardner. It rented it from Winthrop Gardner. It rented it from Winthrop Gardner. And this was other land, Winthrop Gardner. It wasn't until the 1950s that Winthrop Gardner sold most of his land to the Maidstone Club so they could have their golf course and own it. Um, but he always retained the farm. This is the front door, a beautiful front door. This is what Winthrop Gardner looked at when he inherited the house. And he decided that the noise and the, the, the cars and the confusion and, and the village was too much. And so he undertook to take a real colonial house and turn it into a colonial revival mansion and create an estate around it. Uh, the farm was gone. Uh, he kept many of the buildings. The animals were gone. Uh, and then he decided to move the house 275 feet back. Supposedly, they, they jacked it up. They put greased logs under it. Uh, they got teams of horses, though Bob Hefner cannot believe in 1924 they were using teams of horses to build this house. But the newspapers say they used teams of horses. And uh, they moved the house back. It was a very hard choice to do this. In the 1920s, the real money was building colonial revival houses out on Further Lane, Middle Lane, Hither Lane. That's where the action was. Lily Pond Lane, Lee Avenue, they were already built up. Those houses were from the 1880s, 1890s. So for Winthrop Gardner to say, I'm going to live right in the center of town, uh, and I don't care about all this other stuff. I'm going to make my own little oasis, was fascinating. Um, he sort of did what people are doing now. Everybody wants to live close to the village. He wanted to live close to the village 100 years ago. So he started a 10-year project to move this house back. It took five years to move the house back. At the time he moved it, he moved the center block. These wings were added. He hired the uh, architect Joseph Greenleaf Thorpe, 
who was a darling architect of the summer colony. He did many, many houses in East Hampton. He was a very good architect. He worked on taking the house and expanding it into a colonial revival mansion. Uh, much, much work was done. They needed to build a new foundation. If you ever look at the foundation of this house, it is exquisite. Because of the land that Winthrop owned in the Northwest Woods, there were many abandoned farmhouses up there. And he sent the masons up there uh, to take all the stones from the farmhouses from the 1700s and 1800s and bring them to East Hampton. And those were the stones he used for the foundation. Um, he added the wings. He added a modern kitchen in the back. He added plumbing, electrical, moldings, new windows and doors, a new grand staircase, a new living room, a new master bedroom. All the bedrooms had ensuite bathrooms. Remember when David there, there was no bathrooms. Um, there's a very famous silhouette that we'll look at a little later over the mantelpiece. And many people go in, it's where men's clothing is today, and they look at that silhouette. And it was done by an Italian artist who was a friend of Winthrop's. And it's of a carriage drive called Rotten Row, which is in Hyde Park in London. And it's probably the most famous carriage drive in the world. In the uh, 1800s and 1900s, all the royals in, in the UK would take their carriages out and parade up and down Rotten Row. And uh, they used that for the silhouette that's over the fireplace. Winthrop was very interested in the grounds of the property. There were several ancient trees on the property that he was very careful to uh, preserve. But he also added lots and lots of uh, uh, fir trees, rhododendrons, thousands and thousands of daffodil bulbs. Uh, he changed the driveway. It then came up to the front of the house. Uh, and he built this fabulous sunken garden. Between 1924 and 32, Winthrop spent 265000 on the property, fixing it up. That would be about $3.8 million today's dollars. Uh, one of the observers in the paper wrote that there has been so much alteration and change, scarcely anyone will recognize it, but this will be one of the finest houses here. The house was ready in June of 1929 for Winthrop Gardner, his wife, and their three children who lived down the street to move in just months before the crash. Winthrop Sr. and his wife raised their three children here uh, in the new house. They were all in their teenage years or approaching their teenage years when they moved in in 1929. Um, what's interesting is we don't know a lot about Winthrop Sr., the guy who built this, who did this house. We know a lot about his children, and some of you here know his children. They were real characters, and I'm going to talk about them briefly because they're very interesting. This is Winthrop Gardner Jr., their only son, a uh, dashing playboy of the mid-20th uh, century, uh, called the black sheep of the family, uh, had six wives. Um, some of his marriages lasted literally weeks. Uh, some of them lasted months. This is when he was married to Sonia Henney, the uh, Olympic skater, three-time gold medal winner. Um, she was sort of a Madonna of her time in, in, the 19, uh, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s. This woman really commanded a lot of respect. She was an actress. Um, she was clever beyond belief. Uh, when she died, she left an estate of $41 million. Winthrop, of course, has always been attractive to wealthy women, and he married many of them. And I think it's because the money had thinned, and he knew that if he wanted to live the life he had, uh, he really needed to marry up. Uh, he was very famous uh, in, in piloting airplanes. He was also a race car driver. Uh, he lived in the Bahamas, and then he moved back to that mill cottage that his father had had on James Lane, and that's where he lived out his later years. His last wife was Nancy Wakeman, um, and she was an heir to the John Deere farm machine. Uh, in, in, in the last year of his life, he was suffering from cancer. He was living at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York as he was dying, and he decided to divorce Nancy while he was in the hospital. Um, the other thing we know about him is so interesting was he was the guy that inherited Gardner's Island when it uh, came to him by, uh, by the death of a relative. He was 24 years old in 1936. Uh, two gardeners had traded the island. One had sold it to another family member. There was a mortgage. Um, Winthrop inherits the island, and he also inherits the mortgage. He cannot pay the mortgage. He's 24 years old. His father doesn't want to help him. And so the island goes into foreclosure, and uh, it goes up for sale. And Sarah Diodati Gardner, 
his aunt steps in and buys the island for $400,000. He's probably best known for that. Robert Gardner, who you saw in the movie, called him C Cousin Winnie. He thought that he was just a, a scatterbrain. Uh, his first scotch was at 2 o'clock. He had many more scotches by 3 o'clock every day. Uh, and according to Robert Gardner, he died penniless. Their other daughter, a uh, sister of Winthrop, Fanny Gardner Collins, well known to many people here. She only died in 2011. She lived in Springs. She was a very unusual individual, an animal lover par none, a tomboy. She wore cowboy boots. She talked tough. She smoked unfiltered cigarettes. She was a great horsewoman. Um, she was a regular at John Pappas in her last years where she would command a booth and look over her father's estate, which had then become the LVIS. She died in Virginia seven years ago. The third daughter, which was the most conventional in terms of the society that they were born into, uh, was Isabel Gardner Mars. Uh, this is her wedding invitation. Uh, it made the front page, of course, of the East Hampton Star. Uh, she got married at St. Luke's Church in 1934. The reception was in her father's sunken garden. Uh, they floored the garden over to make a gigantic dance floor for 150 guests. Um, her son is Billy Mars Gardner, who still lives on James Lane. Um, in a cottage that was next to the other cottage. Uh, she died in her rose garden on James Lane at age 91 in 2003. So I've talked about the children. What did Winthrop, their father, senior, look like? We don't know much about what he looked like, but he liked to dress up. Um, here he is in 1924 as probably a gardener uh, ancestor, sort of in a conquistador outfit. Um, and this was the, at the 275th anniversary of the village. I uh, was on the green, and he's greeting. Uh, these aren't Indians. These are other village people dressed up as Indians, uh, <laughs> but a character. I also found costumes of him at Halloween and everything else, but not a lot of other pictures of him. He moved to, uh, he sells the house. Uh, so he sells uh, 95 Main Street in 1950. I think the money had thinned tremendously. He moves to Connecticut, and he dies there in 1970. The house was sold to uh, Lawrence Baker Sr., an attorney from New York and Washington, a world-class tennis player, a founding member of the Tennis Hall of Fame, a legal counsel to the U.S. Lawn Tennis Association from 1935 to 72, a trustee of this library, a Maidstone member. Um, he moved in, and we don't know a lot about what the interiors looked like in the Gardner years, but these were the renovations that Winthrop had done and I think the house stayed very much the same when the Bakers bought it. And this is the front entrance hall that uh, Joseph Greenleaf Thorpe had changed dramatically with the graceful staircase. Um, Baker decides to subdivide the property. He puts three housing lots in the far back corner. The land in the far, far back had already been sold off for other things. Um, and about the house is left now with three acres, the sunken garden and the uh, garage. There's always been a question of that easement on the, the left side of the LVIS. It's the land that goes between the sunken garden and the historical society property and the Cartier property. And that easement was created in the 1950s um, to service the three residential lots behind the house. Um, they never opened it up. It's a 30-foot wide easement. Uh, when it comes to the street, it's a 90-foot wide easement uh, because that's what the village required. Um, the people who now live in those lots behind the house uh, use the LVIS driveway, and now the, the easement cannot be opened up, uh, but it's where the berm is, it's where the overgrown vegetation is if you look at the front of the house. We're going to go through a couple of interior shots of the house. These are supposedly taken in 1975, which is hard to imagine because it looks so old-fashioned, but th you know, at Baker would have been in his 80s or 90s, and this may be the way he decorated the house from the 50s, and he never changed it. We're looking at the, uh, this is the dining room. Uh, you can see the staircase out front, so that's the front foyer. This is now where knickknacks are. The book department was here. My mom actually sat here and sold books for many, many years. Uh, this is now where the open counter is if you check out. Uh, this arch is still here, that arch is still here, but this was their dining room. This was the music room. So if you walk in the house uh, and turn right, this is where women's clothes is. And the most amazing thing is that when Winthrop Gardner did these renovations, he had this room sunk uh, about f two or three feet down. It was very popular in the 20s to have sunken rooms. They were thought to be glamorous. 
So you'd come in, you'd go to the right, you'd go into the sunken uh, music room, uh, and Baker looks like he just kept it the way it was. Uh, the door here, this wall is all gone. This is all now women's clothes. This is the dining room. So here we see the mantelpiece flanked by the French doors, the rotten row silhouette, um, and looking out onto the terrace, looking out onto the sunken garden. This picture is fascinating. So upstairs where the boardroom is now, um, this was an Art Deco bedroom. And, um, and so my guess is that Baker's children lived here. Whenever you go to the LVI, the table, the board table is here. My, my friends at the LVIS always say, why is this fireplace off center? Why is this fireplace off center? I think it's off center because it was built later. It's a modern fireplace. You can see the deco mantel shelf. I think they wanted it off center. It was not one of the original fireplaces to the house. This is the master bedroom. So this is now the parlor on the second floor overlooking the garden. Uh, mantelpiece is still there. And you can see all the incredible vegetation snow outside. So bad things happened. Uh, in 1979, there was a tremendous fire in the back of the house. There was a tenant living in some of the servants' wings, and it burned a tremendous m amount of the back of the house off. The tenant was actually died. The individual died in the fire. Um, Baker dies. Uh, Baker Sr. dies the next year in 1980, um, and his son takes over the ownership of the house. The son starts renovations, trying to repair it from the fire. The fire had actually crept into a little bit of the front of the house. There's pictures of him stripping some of the front rooms down to two by fours, but he's unable or unwilling to complete the renovation, and the house just sits there. As you can see, it went into a great decline. Uh, about a year later, 1981, Baker puts the house up for sale. So we have this derelict gray gardens kind of house right in the center of town in bad shape. And this is looking from the sunken garden up towards the French doors in the living room, the back of the house, the trees are wild, no one's taking care of it. Uh, and it becomes a huge issue, uh, a controversy in East Hampton Village, what to do with this house. Um, all hell breaks loose. The mayor at the time, Doug Dayton, floats a proposal, uh, and there were many, many versions of this proposal, that the house be moved back to where it sat on the street, and that different parking lots be put on this property because parking was a huge issue in the uh, 80s in East Hampton uh, uh, and they wanted more parking. Uh, that did not sit well with a lot of people. There was another proposal to make it the new Village Hall. There was another proposal to let the East Hampton Historical Society restore it, take it over as a museum. Um, the many, many proposals flew and as the, we went into 1981, 82, 83, the house continued to deteriorate. Um, Doug Dayton was ousted as mayor. There was so much ill will towards his idea about creating parking lots. Um, the Village Preservation Society was formed as a reaction to this to make sure that the house was preserved. And in the end, uh, it was preserved. Uh, it deteriorated in 1985, 86. In 1980, the village bought it in uh, 83 for 350,000 and just sat on it. They would not maintain it. They would not do anything to it. Uh, finally, in 1987, there was so much pressure to preserve the house that the LVIS steps forward and saves it. And the rest of the story is for another lecture. <laughs> Great, Rick. See you after. Oh, I, Oh, it could be one. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We're going to do a quick Q&A if anybody has some questions. Yes, ma'am. His farm was in town, and that was, I think it was just easier. He, his, the huge farm was there, and he wanted to use it. Okay, and did they ever own slaves? That's not in East Hampton, but possibly on Gardner's Island. I don't know. I know Sylvester Manor had many slaves on Shelter Island. I've heard that too. I don't know. You can spend years reading about the Gardner family and all the things that they did. It's just astonishing. 
Any other questions? Yes, sir. I wish. Uh, and, and, and when Mr. Gardner was there doing it, uh, he really it wasn't just the Boy Scouts. He enabled all kind of tours and bird watching and so forth. And uh, in full respect to the Golettes, they've not been as open in terms of access. Uh, I think there should be, there should be uh, very limited access. Uh, the 95% conservation easement, incidentally, is up in, well, kind of to do the arithmetic, uh, 2024. Uh, and uh, I, th I think that's going to be a turning point. Uh, are they going to want to have another conservation easement? Could folks in East Hampton make, I mean, at least you guys, most of whom are residents of East Hampton, really deserve to see I mean, this is the most bucolic, I, I, I'm just using words, you've got to be there kind of thing, place, and it's, it's in your backyard, and, and you deserve to see that island offshore. I mean, we invited the Golettes to come and participate in any possible way here. I know the Historic Society uh, did an exhibition on Gardner's Island a few years ago. They invited the Golettes to participate. They are, are, are gracious in declining, but they really want no participation in any of these events. Yes, sir. Well, I wanted to, and I, my talk was running 25 minutes. That is an amazing story. That was Sarah Diodati Gardner's house. Uh, she built it in the 30s. Um, I think I'm going to use it as a topic for next year. But that is a spectacular house. The most interesting thing was when she died in 1953, she gave it to the village of East Hampton to be used as a town hall or a museum or any public pur purpose they deemed with a $40,000 endowment. The village thought about it for a month and gave it right back to her estate. <laughs> it was considered a white elephant in 1953. But that's a great story, and maybe next year. Yes, ma'am. Oh, that building with the tall shingle tower. The highest point on the island is actually, once I got behind it with my wife in a sailboat to protect us from a storm, a, an interesting tower. Uh, uh, that was used during the war. Naval personnel were stationed there. Uh, it was kind of, they did a masquerade and made it look like a windmill. Uh, and it was a spotting tower for uh, German submarines. Uh, that was during the war. I'm not familiar with this situation. I, I can't believe they had any building regulations on the island at all. It was a world unto itself. Oh. Oh. We'd have to go over and take a look. I, 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 <laughs> yes. Oh, no, no, th th that is correct. Uh, what, what they've done is simple to what the, the federal government has done on Plum Island to try to enhance security with cameras all over the place. That, that I know is true. Yes. That I, that I don't. Plum Island I've been on bunches of times, too. Uh, and I don't know. The, the interesting thing is when any of those children died, that uh, three children of Winthrop Gardner, none of them were allowed to be buried on Gardner's Island. And Robert, who they didn't like at all, he wanted to be buried on Gardner's Island. He ended up in East Hampton. So there have been no recent burials on Gardner's a Island. And just a quick thing about Plum Island. I mean, that wasn't for spotting. It, it looks like Corregidor. You go, go to you know, the end of the island facing Connecticut, and there's like emplacements for guns to, uh, it was during the Spanish-American War, to stop any f Spanish fleet from heading to New York. Uh, so that, that, that was even more uh, of a military uh, site, more like Montauk, you know, with, with the, the gun. Yeah. yeah.